the last time uh, I stood before you, we talked about uh, some of the important things that the Church of Christ are facing in general, the whole body of Christ. And uh, these are making a negative you know, impact on the Lord, especially for those outside of Christianity okay, looking at us. That's why, you know, over the web, um, circulating on the social media, there was apparently uh, said by uh, Mahatma Gandhi when uh, he said, you know, I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians. Hmm. Your Christians are so unlike Christ. <laughs> well, you know, this is one of the greatest hurdles of Christianity. And, um, you know, to reflect Christ in us, that is what the problem with Christians in general. We do not reflect the Christ in us. You know, a truly converted individual, again, as we said, will not be judgmental. You know, will not raise his eyebrow and murmur over the other guy, you know, uh, because of he wears, what he wears and how, how the other guy looks like. And another problem that we Christians are doing is we fight. We fight over doctrine. We fight over small things. You know, things that are not relevant to salvation. And that's what's happening around us. And, you know, the funny thing is we are holding the same Bible. We're holding the same book. The same Doctrine, and yet we go on on a heated debate you know, over it, and we fight, you know, over it, and literally, as well, we fight literally. You know, I have seen Christians versus Christians, you know, fighting it out, fist fight. <laughs> um, I've heard one debate a few years back. Uh, they are debating about the essentiality of baptism. And the other debater challenged the other guy to a fist fight in the parking lot. Because apparently his mother died without being baptized. And he cannot take the fact that the other guy he was telling that baptism is essential for a man's salvation. And he cannot accept that. So that's why he challenged the other guy. Are you telling me that my mother is not saved? I'm not telling you the Bible is. And then he cannot accept that fact. So he challenged the other guy, let's go outside the parking lot. Let's see. And there are another classic example. There are two big religious groups. You know, they are fighting with each other to the point to the point that they have their own private bodyguards. They have their own so-called private armies, you know, to protect them from each other because they are threatening each other. You see? You know, people looking at us, so-called Christians, as we tear each other apart. And maybe they are laughing at us. You know, look at those people. Look at those Christians. They're fighting each other. And guess what? Bloods were already shed among Christians fighting among each other. And relationships are torn down. Because of what we are trying to do to each other. Now, even inside this so called religious group or inside each congregation, we divide each other because of what? Because of power? Because of money? And to be honest, there's politics inside religion. And this is the truth. And these are happening until right this very moment, you know. 
We tear the body of Christ so that we could have our own power instead. Instead of Christ being glorified, we want ourselves to be glorified. Instead of Christ's word, be pushed and convict people, we try to deliver our own message and try to manipulate them. There's a new show in Netflix. I'm now an avid fan of Netflix. Uh, a documentary what happened in 1993 in Waco, Texas. And I think Waco the Apocalypse. That's the title of that documentary. You, know, you, you, you go and uh, check that out. And you know, these are happening. These are happening. These are happening because Christians are not truly converted. And we're not focused on Christ, but rather we are focused on ourselves. We're not focused on Christ, but rather we are focused on our own so-called righteousness rather than God's righteousness. We're focused on getting people to meet our own standards rather than the standards of God. That's found in the Bible. These and other realities are destroying the body of Christ because of wrong conversions. And this morning, we will talk about where does real transformation, where does real change comes from? We'll talk about the power of God's word to transform. You know, knowing the truth, teaching the truth, and living the truth, embodying that truth, those are three totally different things. Knowing and doing are totally different from each other. You know, when I was a kid, I really wanted to become a magician. <laughs> it's, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> it's my dream. No, learn those magic tricks, especially those street magics, uh, those close-up magics that you see on television. You know, and uh, I bought myself so many books. Uh, I've watched so many videos, and I even bought, uh, even bought me a. Uh, small magic props, you know. And I told myself, I will make myself good at this. And I even told myself, I will make a fortune out of this. And uh, <laughs> decades and decades later, you know, I'm not still a magician. <laughs> and I have not even made a single centavo. <laughs> and until now, I'm dreaming, until now, I'm dreaming to be a magician. You want some sample? You want some sample magic? <laughs> you, know, you know, why? Why? Why am I not still a magician? Despite the fact that I bought so many books, I've read so many books, you know, I've watched so many videos, you know, because I never really practiced. I never really practice what those books taught and said. And I never really practice what those seasoned magicians taught in their videos. No. Now, bottom line, it did not change me. It did not change me. James said, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. So, brothers and sisters and friends, I'm deceiving myself because of not doing what I'm supposed to do. I'm not doing what those books had written and had said and what those in the video said. Do not be just hearers, but doers of the word. And Jesus said, in Luke 11, 28, Jesus replied, But even more blessed are all who hear the word of God and put it into practice. Again, James and Jesus Christ agreed that we must not only listen, but we must do those things that we listen to. Now, transformation comes when you listen to the word. That's number one. You listen to the truth. 
Without listening, you will never be informed. You will never know the truth. If you close your ears to the truth and you close your ears to those who try to teach you, you will never learn. Try to go to school and put on your uh, headset and try not to listen to your professor and try not to read the books. You will never learn. You will never be transformed. So number one is when you listen to the word. Listening, you know, listening to preachers, listening to church leaders. But let me tell you, listening to these people is different from listening to the very word of God. I want you to listen to the word of God. I know you're listening to me right now. Yes, you are. But don't listen to me as if the words and the, the message that I'm trying to convey to you comes from me. It comes from God. The very word that you're reading a while ago, it comes from God. It didn't come from me. So don't listen to me. Listen to the word of God. And that's what I'm asking you. Listen to the word of God. Because the word of God is the truth. Just like the song that we sang. We are the feet. We are the tongue. But those are not my words. Those are not your words. Those are God's words. We are just used by God to deliver those words of His. So you listen to that word. Now when you listen, you must read the scriptures. You must study, you must analyze the scriptures. Just like what the Bereans did. When they were taught with the scriptures, they analyzed the scriptures. They studied the scriptures to see if what was said was so. And, you know, this is where Christians fail. This is where we fail. Because we listen to people. We put our trust on people. We listen to them as if their words are the authority. Don't listen to me because my words are not the authority. You listen to God's word because those are the authority. You read your Bible because the Bible is the authority. Not other you know, so-called books of information or reference books. Those just are uh, our help, but those are not authority. This is where we fail because we listen to the church leaders. We listen to preachers. We put our confidence in them. We don't open our Bible. We just say, Amen. But we don't open our Bible. Listen to God. Listen to His Word. You know, we give our loyalty to them instead we give, or instead of giving it to God. And you know, these leaders, they try to manipulate, as I've said a while ago, they try to manipulate the members and try to elevate themselves as if they are God. And true enough, many people are saying they are God. That's why we must read and study the Bible. You listen to God. Proverbs 8, 32. The Lord said, Now therefore, my sons, listen to me. For blessed are those who keep my ways. So you listen to the very word of God. Open your heart to the message of God. Transformation comes when you do what it says. When you listen, that's the first part. The second part is when you do what it says. And when you do what it says, that's where this word comes in. Conviction. Conviction is when a person firmly convinced what was said to him is actually true. That is the basic meaning of conviction. And when one person, when you become guilty of your sins through the exposition of your sins, of your deeds, which leads you to repentance and new life. 
That is conviction. Now, the Bible speaks of both. When you read the gospel, conviction comes when you are truly convinced that what you're listening to is God's word. You must first be convinced that what you are reading and what you are listening to is God's word. Because without convincing yourself of that, you can never be transformed. Faith comes from what? Faith comes from hearing. Amen. Exactly. Hearing. And hearing what? Hearing my word. Hearing Brother Chow's word. Hearing Brother Derek's word. I don't think so. Hearing comes from listening. Or faith comes from listening to the word of who? God. And Jesus said, and James said, you must do what it says. See? We must convince ourselves that what we heard and what you read is God's word. God's very own word. And when you, we believe that, you come to believe that Jesus is the son of God. And Jesus died for you. And secondly, the word of God convicts you of your sins and realizing it, you turn away from your sins. You turn away from your sins and you come to God. And again, what James and Jesus said that we must not only be hearers of the word, we must be doers of the word. That is conviction, my dear brethren and friends. When you are transformed, when you believe and you do what you heard and what you read, that is conviction. And that's where transformation comes in. You know, when you finally, you know, really felt that guilt inside you, it's like a consuming fire that needs to be hosed down with water. It's like when you're so thirsty that your thirst needs to be quenched immediate, immediately or else you will die. See? And this is the kind of sorrow, the kind of repentance, the kind of conviction that God wants from each and every one of us. Apostle Paul said, yet now I am happy. Not because you were made sorry, but because your sorrow led you to repentance. God wants you to be convicted of your sins. That leads you to repentance. For you become sorrowful as God intended. And so we're not harmed in any way by us. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow it brings to them. You see, God wants you to have that godly sorrow that you feel so sorry about yourself. When you read the Bible, when you heard God's word and you analyze it, you feel that guilt and it consumes you. That you feel like dying. And the only way to survive that is when you accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. And only Jesus Christ can quench that thirst, can hose down that fire that is consuming you and nobody else. You know, a very powerful love story, the scripture reading a while ago, it is about Hosea. The husband and the wife, Gomer. God told Hosea in Hosea chapter 1, you know, to go get him a wife. And God said, you go get this person, this particular woman, a harlot, a prostitute, to be your wife. And as an obedient man, obedient servant of God that he, he was, he went. And take Gomer as his wife. And during their relationship as husband and wife, Gomer remains unfaithful. He went out, go to another man, go to another bed. Then Hosea take him in, and then Gomer went out again. See? Gomer was an unfaithful woman. But Hosea keeps on accepting him, keeps on loving him. You know, again, let us just go to Hosea chapter 3, 1 to 3. Finally, 
finally, in Gomer's life, God said to Hosea, go show your love to your wife again. Though she is loved by another man and is an adulteress, love her as the Lord loves the Israelites. Though they turn to other gods and love the sacred raisin cakes. So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and about a homer and lettuce of barley. Then told her, you are to live with me many days. You must not be a prostitute or be intimate with any man. I will behave the same way toward you. You see, Hosea bought her wife back again with 15 shekels of silver and barley. 15 shekels of silver, that's three months' salary during that time. And another, the barley, according to scholars, that is equivalent to another 15 shekels of silver. So that's in all a half year salary during that time. So Hosea sacrificed that six month of salary of his and she, he bought back his wife, Gomer. Okay. And, you know, after Gomer sold herself to slavery and probably after being deserted, deserted by her lover, and this time, the wife hit rock bottom. Nowhere else to go. Just like the story in The Prodigal Son. Right? She has nowhere else to go. She was dirty and all. But Hosea paid six months of his wage and took her back again. Now, how many of us have reached rock bottom? How many of us have reached that stage wherein we are looking for hope? We are searching for answers. That we are in the mud waiting for someone to come and to help us out. Or maybe we're just starting to find answers to our questions, to life's questions. We are, find, we are starting to find those answers that would somehow help us out in our misery. You know, many people out there are suffering. Many people out there, the reason why they're not inside this building is probably they're seeing that many Christians are unloving. Probably they are seeing that many Christians are unwelcoming. We must be like Hosea. We must be like this man. We must be like God. We must be like Jesus Christ. Who welcomed those sinners. Who went out. Looked for those people that needed healing. Especially spiritual healing. You know, I know I'm one of those persons. I know. Now, the question is, how can anyone such have a great love? How can Hosea have that great love for his wife? After being so unfaithful for so many times, why? You know, the answer is right there. As the Lord loves. Amen. As the Lord loves. Only a truly converted person can truly understand that praise from our God. Only a truly converted person that experienced God's mercy and love for him can truly understand why Hosea can Continuously forgive and love his wife, Gomer. If you truly understand who you were before you accepted the Lord and what you did before that and what he did for you, you will understand why 
Hosea did what he did. Because as the Lord loves. Hosea understood what God did to him. Hosea understood what God did to the nation of Israel. Even though they are so unfaithful, even though their hearts are so adulterous, even though that their heart was so adulterous, God continued to love them. And Hosea did just that, as the Lord loves. You know, while the scripture is silent, what happened next to their love story, or what happened next to, to Gomer, I can only assume that God used Hosea's supreme act of love and forgiveness to convict her. To melt her heart and to transform her life. And they live happily ever after. You know, the choice is actually with Gomer, with the wife. The choice is actually hers. If she wants to continue living in sin, the choice is actually in us. If we want, if you want to continue to live in your sins, go ahead, by all means. If you want to continue living in your sins, go ahead. Don't listen to what I'm telling you. Don't listen to God. At the end of the day, you will die, not me. I pray to You know, there's a, uh, one funny thing that I did, just like this. I was talking to a couple of people. And I'm telling them, if you love yourself, okay, if you love yourself, you accept the Lord. But if you truly, truly love yourself, you continue with your sins. They were like, Why, brother? Why? I keep, you know, the, the message is clear. But if you if your choice, I tell them, it's your choice. I cannot change you. It is your choice. If you want to continue living in sin, then go ahead. Satisfy your cravings. At the end of the day, it is not me who will go to where we're supposed to go. It is you. I will, I will be responsible for myself. God will judge me. He will not judge you because of what I did. No. No way. And I will not be judged because of what you did. Right? Fortunately, fortunately, many accepted the Lord. <laughs> But, you know, the choice is ours. Yesterday, when me and Brother Kennedy was, was, we were talking, and he was actually uh, telling me about choices. And I was not making any comment about that. Because I'll be trying to relay a message about it today. So I don't want to preempt. <laughs> That's why I was, I was quiet. The whole time, Brother Kennedy, when you were talking about choices, when you were talking about that the, the Bible should transform us, I was quiet the whole time. <laughs> you know, but again, we have to give account for our own actions to God. It is our choice. It is your choice. Now, here's one main point, my dear brothers and sisters, that I want to point out with Hosea and Gomer. You know, Prophet Hosea, did not ask Gomer to change. You read the book. He did not. He did not ask his wife to change. No. But rather, his supreme act of love and forgiveness for her was meant to change her. You get that? Yeah. Amen. You know, Hosea just showed her the way of true love. What true love is. Just as God showed Hosea what true love is, just as God showed what true love is to the nation of Israel, 
He just supported her and just keep on loving her. Then at the end, Hosea was just hoping that his wife would see the true love that he was giving him, the true forgiveness that, that, that he, was, he was giving her. And soon that underlying love of his, you know, that would melt her heart. And indeed, I believe so that it melted her heart because of what the husband, Hosea, did to her. You see, brothers and sisters, the undying love of Hosea was the very message of God. God used Hosea to deliver that message to all of us right until this very moment. Listen, that no one is beyond forgiveness. That no one is beyond restoration. Amen to that. The year was 1986. <laughs> 1986. I was just a young kid in my first year high school. My cousins <clears throat> and my sister Mary uh, I'm not used to used in uh, calling her Mary. I call her Ate Merj. M-E-R-J. <laughs> Ate, Ate, that's a Tagalog term that we use to address our older sister, a sign of respect, Ate. Or uh, A-T-E. So we, we call her Ate. You know? And that time, my cousin said, my ate, uh, they invited me over for a Bible study. And that's where it all started. You know, the rest was history. And the point is, they did not change me. And I did not change for them. They did not ask me to change. No. My spiritual mentor did not ask me to change. The gospel of Jesus Christ changed me. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the one that convicted me, not them. You know, those people, they were only used by God to bring the message to me, to deliver the message to me. But it was the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the gospel that convicted me. It's the gospel that transformed me. It's the gospel of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ that was planted in me that changed me. It's my decision. It's my decision, not them, based on the conviction that I got from reading the scriptures that I was transformed. Now remember, Jesus said in his commission to all of us, our commission was to preach the gospel. We are to go out and to preach the gospel. We are to bring the gospel to every individual that we come across with. Bring the gospel. You know, we are like sower. We are like the sower, right? We cast out the seed. We throw out the seed into the hearts of, very, of, of every individual. And we let that seed, by the grace and love of God, grow in them and transform them. It is not our purpose to change them. It is not your purpose to change them. It is not my purpose to change you. My purpose is to deliver the unadulterated message of God, to deliver the gospel of Jesus Christ to all of you, and let that gospel convict you, and let, this, and let that gospel grow in you and transform you. It is up to you, my dear brothers and sisters. You know, when, when someone comes in here okay, and looking for God and looking for family, when someone comes up to you looking for answers, looking for scriptures, asking for prayers, you don't turn them down. You give the gospel. You pray for them. Let the scripture work in them. Let the gospel convict them. That is your purpose. That is my purpose. It is not for us to change. It is God who will change them. It is Jesus who will change them. It is through the gospel that will change them. And it is up to them if they would accept the calling. It is up to them if they will accept Jesus Christ into their hearts as their Lord and Savior and be baptized and become a part 
of God's family or not. It is not for us to do that. It is up to us to encourage them. We encourage them. We pray for them. We love them. And we must be rooting for them. So that at the end of their, before the end of their life, they would come to their senses and be convicted of God's message and be converted and be transformed. That is our purpose. By God's grace and mercy and love, they will be convicted as well. And God is the one who will judge them, not us. You know, when I first studied the Bible, I, I, I didn't immediately change. No. Change did not come immediately. There was a process. You know, my mouth back then was filthy. I was cursing, you know. But you know, even if the people ask me to stop cursing, I will not stop. I will not stop. But you know what? It is the gospel of Jesus that made me stop. It convicted me of my sins and it tells me that what I was doing was wrong. It's the gospel of Jesus that made me who I am today. It is the gospel of Jesus that made me think right. Now, if you ask me if I want to go back in my old life, my old self, you know, I will tell you, no way. <laughs> no way. No way I'm going back. Now, you want to know why? You want to know why? Because it is the gospel of Jesus Christ that's telling me not to go back. The very same gospel that convicted me is the very same gospel that's telling me not to go back. And it's because of Jesus Christ. And that is the power of the gospel. Sooner or later, as the gospel works in our hearts, in their hearts, that you will see the transformation. You will see that you will be transformed individual. And I've seen this happen. I've seen it happen. You know. You don't, we don't need to tell the other guy. If someone comes here and he and he, and, he, and he is wearing shorts, you don't need to tell that that guy. No, next next Sunday, you come wearing pants. You don't need to tell that guy to to come next Sunday to wear pants because sooner or later, come next Sunday, that guy would be wearing pants, not because of you, but because of the word of God that convicts him. He would be feel ashamed. Just like what happened to me. At first, when I read the Bible, in my first, very first Bible study, I was laughing. I was laughing at the Bible. I was laughing during my Bible study. I was laughing. I was not serious. I was not listening. But you know, the, the, the brothers, they, they did not tell me to stop laughing. No, they just let me be. They just let me be. And soon after, when I came back, I was serious. And I was asking more questions. Why? Because the gospel is starting to work in me. Started, starting to convict me. And I was ashamed. I felt ashamed for what I'm doing. I felt I, I, I was disrespecting God. You see, that changed me. That changed me. It is the gospel that will change people. It is not you. You are just to bring the gospel to them. You are to encourage them. The gospel changed me. It, the, the brothers, they did not change me. My cousins, my sister, they did not change me. It is the gospel that changed me. The gospel will change people in God's perfect time. And they will soon act accordingly. Because of shame, just like what I did. And they will respond with proper respect to God. Isaiah 55, 11, the Lord said, But it shall accomplish that which I purpose. So shall my word be that goes out, of, out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty. Now remember this. There is no time wasted. There is no effort wasted. There is even... No, no gospel wasted when you share 
the gospel to someone. You know, during my time back back home, when we were trying to uh, uh, teach the Bible students, we go out on the streets, and they were giving flyers. We we're giving flyers for how many days? We we're giving flyers on the streets, and they were like, "Brother Mike, I think our effort is futile. It's we're doing, you know." We're wasting our time because nobody's listening. They are throwing away all the flyers on the streets. And one of the street sweeper came up to me. And she said, she said, I, I remember her. So you are the one that giving all these flyers for so many days. You are the one that causing this, you know, on the streets, litter on the streets. I was trying, I, I'm, I'm picking them up. I'm following all the people because they're just throwing it on the ground. Please, stop giving it away. They're just throwing it on the ground. See? But I told the brothers, you know, there's no time wasted. There's no effort wasted when you do something for God. Amen? And I remember my experience I think 1987, when we were giving out flyers inside the market, inside the market, we have a, I have a different, I had a different experience. Inside the market, we're giving, right? Handing out flyers, sharing the gospel. And, you know, funny thing was, they're not throwing it away. The vendors, they're not throwing the flyers away. They love it. They love it. And I was wondering why. And then I found the answer. Barry Kennedy is laughing already. They found the answer. I found the answer. They were actually using it to wrap fishes. <laughs> and they were asking me, do you still have more there, kid? <laughs> <laughs> you see? Oh. <laughs> but then again, when you do something for God's glory, my dear brothers, sisters, and friends, nothing is ever wasted. You know, even if that person seems not interested, you know, in what you're sharing, it's okay. You've done your part. Let the seed convict them, transform them. It is your purpose. That is your purpose. And I have seen the fruits, you know, the, of sharing the gospel. I have seen the fruits of sharing the gospel. The people were transformed. People were transformed. The flyers, the flyers, you know, it went where our feet cannot go. One flyers, it went a hundred miles away. And it transformed people. Right? You see, the gospel, here's the thing, the gospel that was shared to me, that I heard in 1986, do you believe that those gospel was preached to thousands and thousands of people. Do you believe that the, the gospel that I heard, that I've heard in 1986, it was heard in different countries? It had traveled more than a thousand miles. Do you believe that? Believe it. Believe it. And now I'm here in front of all of you. I'm sharing that same gospel the gospel of Jesus Christ to you right now. The one that I've heard in 1986. The same gospel that I've heard. The same gospel that I'm sharing to many people. The same gospel that convicts me, that transformed me, is the same gospel that I'm sharing until this very moment. And God is indeed right. He's right. It shall accomplish that which he purposes. His word that goes out from his mouth, it shall not return to him empty, but it shall accomplish that which he purposes. And it is being accomplished through me. It is being accomplished through all of you by sharing, by us sharing the gospel to those people that are not yet in the fold of Christ. You know, those of you that have not accepted Jesus Christ but are hearing this word, 
you know, his word will come to you. Believe me and trust me on that. His word will come to you. We're going to you. We're going to you. It will find you. And by his grace and mercy and love, it will convict you. And it will, it will accomplish its purpose in you. Don't think for a moment that we can hide from God. Don't think for a moment that we can hide our sins from God. You are wrong because your sins will find you out. If, however, you choose to obey God, you know, let this word transform you. It is this very same word, the gospel. It is the God's power to save you. Romans 1.16, because it is the power of God that brings salvation. Now, let me ask you this before I go. What is the best translation of the scripture? Brother child is smiling. <laughs> what is the best scripture of the Bible? Anybody? Huh? Interaction? You. You are the best translation of the Bible. When you translate it into your life and let it change you, and the people see your transformation, then you are the best translation of the scripture. Now, brethren and friends, let us unite rather than divide. Let us build bridges rather than reach those bridges. Let us encourage rather than discourage. Let us try to open our hearts with compassion more than we open our mouths with criticism. Let us be more loving as the Lord loves. May God bless us all. God bless you.